Is there a place in time where logic breaks down and wonderment begins? Could that be somewhere or sometime along an infinite line between the reasonable and the highly unlikely? Join us on a journey into the improbable. Makeshift Stories presents Episode 292, Leopold's Fix All, read by Alan V. Hare. Opening and closing theme by Matthew Erdman. Somewhere and sometime, a benign machine could end up being a trap. An older version of this story appeared in our feed back in November 16th, 2020, as Life in Kodachrome. Leopold took off his glasses and cleaned them on his shirt tail instead of a disposable tissue. There was a time when he didn't need glasses to do fine work. There was a time when things weren't disposable. There was a time when he could fix anything that came through the door of his shop. But these days, everything was single-use, designed so it couldn't be repaired by people like him. Now, it was all glued together plastic and micro-circuits, with no screws and no user-serviceable parts. There were few things left he could fix, and even fewer customers who wanted their stuff repaired. To occupy his time, Leopold had taken to roaming the back lanes of his neighborhood, which was changing as fast as everything else. Eighty-year-old trees and old wartime strawberry box bungalows were being plowed under and replaced by immense three-story plastic-sided monster homes, which Leopold suspected would prove to be as non-repairable as the things they contained. Behind the houses waiting for their date with a bulldozer, Leopold sifted through the garbage for things he could repair and put into his store, where the all-too-occasional customer bought them for their retro looks rather than functionality. So, he suspected the old slide projector he was almost finished cleaning up would just end up sitting on a shelf, repurposed as a 1940s artifact to complete somebody's interior decor. He had found the projector in the garbage behind Ruth's house as it was being readied for demolition. She was the last original resident of the neighborhood to move out, and a bit of a mystery, having kept to herself for decades. The vintage device had been overlooked by her estate when she was forced to move to an assisted living complex. It made Leopold wonder how many years he had before he would be in the same situation. He wasn't far behind. Was Ruth still alive, living in a place where food was designed to be tasteless so it wouldn't offend people, served on a rigid schedule like daycare? Leopold had heard you needed someone to sign you out. No, that fate wasn't for him. The only way he was going to leave his home was in a hearse. Leopold's immigrant parents owned the storefront where he still lived. They had used it as a corner grocery, but by the time Leopold took over, the big box stores had forced most small merchants out of business. After the grocery failed, he converted the store with its second-story apartment into Leopold's fix-all and a showroom to sell his resurrected appliances. The projector was in mint condition. It had probably been used once or twice a year to show slides of family vacations and only needed to be cleaned up. Even the bulb was still good. However, two slides were jammed in the changer mechanism. Rather than destroy them, Leopold opted to disassemble the projector to get the slides out. This allowed him to scrutinize how the thing worked and lubricate the moving parts. The mechanism had the precision of a clock and the beauty of a Leonardo da Vinci machine. He imagined da Vinci meeting the slide projector's designer. Despite being over 500 years apart, they would still share a common grasp of the beauty of mechanics. The designers of the new phone he had reluctantly bought only five decades on from the slide projector would not. The plastic thing had no finely crafted moving parts, just circuits, glue, and software, nothing mechanical. The closest the projector came to having software were the slides that ran through it. But Leopold could hold a slide, feel the paper of its frame between his fingers, and even see the image it contained without a computer. That was the thing about a physical photo, he mused. It was the result of light interacting with silver halide, forever changing the little crystals, so when a person looked at a surface covered with them, they saw what it had been exposed to. There was no machine, no computer, no software between the original moment and the eye. To make a photo, some people even believed cameras were stealing a piece of their subject's immortal soul. Leopold didn't believe that. However, he was convinced the photos his new phone took were different. 
They were soulless digital abstractions with dubious credibility. He could never be sure what originally had been in front of the lens when he looked at one. Leopold picked up a pair of tweezers, carefully closed them on the yellowed cardboard frame of the first stubborn slide, then pulled. At first, it refused to budge, making him consider cutting it apart to extract. He changed the position of the tweezers and tried again. This time, the slide reluctantly agreed to be removed and popped out, flying across Leopold's workbench, coming to rest near his soldering iron. He quickly poked it away from the hot tip and placed the thing on a foam pad near the air compressor. Leopold decided to examine it later and turned his attention to the empty slot where the slide had jammed. The metal was slightly pinched, probably the reason the slide jammed. He straightened the offending part with his needle nose pliers, did the same for the second slide, using it to test the mechanism, and began reassembling the projector. It was late in the evening when he finally finished. Leopold's eyes were tired from hours of intense work, and he was about to quit for the night when he remembered the slides. They were lying beside the tray, ready to be put back into the projector. He swore he had left at least one on a foam pad. There wasn't a speck of dust on either. Had he cleaned them and forgotten? No, despite his age, Leopold's mind was a steel trap. He didn't forget things. Curious, Leopold picked up the first slide. Disappointingly, it was blank, like it had never been exposed. He put it down and examined the second. This time, one side of the cardboard frame bore the words Kodachrome Transparency, and on the other, the date and name of a film lab were stamped. The ink had been smudged, making it difficult to read. Leopold angled the slide under his work lamp until he could make out the words. Tempest Labs, October 4, 1947, he muttered to himself, then turned his attention to the image fixed on the transparency. It was dark, at first making him wonder if the film had aged badly, obliterating the image. He held it up to his work lamp and could just make out an illuminated figure against a murky background. Maybe it was an underexposed flash photo. Leopold guessed the person was probably a long-dead relative or friend of Ruth, and here was a thirtieth of a second of that person's life, preserved in light-sensitive emulsion. Entranced, Leopold pushed his weariness aside and rummaged in his storage room for the projection screen he had saved from the landfill. He intended to clean it up, but hadn't so far. At first, its mechanical joints resented being pressed into service, but with some WD-40 and Leopold's persistent encouragement, the stand unfolded and the screen popped up. He set the projector in front of it and twisted the power knob until it clicked. A wash of bright light flooded out onto the stained screen, accompanied by the rhythmic clanking of a misaligned fan. Excitedly, he slotted the slide into a metal receptacle on the side of the machine behind the lens, then gently pushed the handle. The bright light was replaced by a dark blue-green fuzz. Leopold twisted a ring at the end of the lens tube until the fuzz resolved into a middle-aged man standing beside a 1940s Cadillac, holding the driver's side door open. He was dressed in a black suit, a brown trilby hat, and a blue shirt open at the collar, revealing a white undershirt. It was dusk, and the camera's limited flash had caused everything other than the man and the car to be underexposed. In the shadows of the background, Leopold could just make out the silhouette of a new small house. He was pretty sure it was Ruth's place. It was on a treeless street. The blurry edge of something else in the foreground might have been part of a car door frame. Had the picture been taken through the open window of another vehicle? The man's head was turned, but his eyes looked accusingly into the lens. His smile was ambiguous, as if he was in the process of deciding whether or not he wanted his picture taken. Maybe the projector was losing focus as it heated up, or maybe Leopold's tired eyes were playing tricks, but the man on the slide appeared to move. He had changed to a blur at the boundary between the surface of the screen and the room, and then, without warning, stood beside the projector. Leopold jumped back in surprise. How'd you... He shook his head, then stood. No, I'm just imagining this. The man in the suit and Trilby smiled and looked around the workshop. Hey, thanks, buddy. 
Leopold chanced to glance at the screen. The house, the treeless street, and the caddy were still there, but the man was gone. Replaced by the shadow of someone lying on the ground in front of the car, the smell of aqua velva and stale cigarettes began to fill the workshop. You're, you're real? Leopold backed up against his bench. The man, maybe thirty-five, a head shorter than Leopold and a bit on the stout side, stood defiant and intimidatingly close. Of course I'm real. I've been trapped in that, that crummy, crummy moment for... what day is it? The apparition's eyes darted wildly around the workshop until they settled on a paper calendar carefully tacked to the wall. His face went pale, then red. She lied, he yelled. It was only supposed to be until the heat was off, until everyone stopped looking for me. A couple of weeks at most, that was the deal. Then she'd switch me with some other poor sap. It needs a soul, you know, that's what she told me. There always has to be at least one person trapped in it. He waved angrily at the projector. But it's been, what, decades? She imprisoned me in that thing for an entire life. The man smashed his fist down on the workbench, shaking all Leopold's tools. So you were somehow trapped in that picture? Leopold asked, trying to inch away from the phantom man as it edged closer. Can't you feel it reaching out? It wants someone. It needs someone. Leopold's eyes darted around the workshop, looking for a way out but the bins of old parts and junk he had collected over the years crowded in, blocking all but one path to the door, which the angry presence was blocking. And it ain't going to be me, the man spat, cornering Leopold. You, you're old. You've had a chance to live your life. Me, look at me. I was barely halfway through mine. It's not fair. I'm not going back. He lunged at Leopold. Maybe twenty years ago, Leopold could have dodged but his joints and muscles, used to sitting at his workbench for hours, took too long to respond. The apparition grabbed Leopold by the collar, then threw him into the projector beam. No, this isn't real, Leopold protested before disappearing into the light. There, you got someone else now. Leave me alone. The man checked the projection. Leopold was lying on the ground beside the big caddy, his face fixed forever with surprise and confusion written across it. Satisfied, the man quickly removed the slide from the projector, found a pair of scissors on the workbench, and cut the transparency into tiny pieces. Gone. Now I can't go back. I'm free. The projector's mechanism clicked, and the second slide dropped into place. A photo of Leopold's workshop began to resolve. It was empty except for the shadow of a man wearing a trilby next to the workbench. No, no, you can't have me. I won't let you. He tried to run, but the floor tilted at an impossible angle. His leather-soled shoes scrambled for traction until gravity won out and he tumbled into the projector's beam. Hey, look at this, the woman said, pulling the slide projector from the dumpster behind the old corner store. The store was being demolished after its owner disappeared. It'll look great beside that antique camera you picked up. She smiled, carefully placing the old machine in her backpack. I think there's even a slide in it. I want to see what it is when we get home. You can help us create original content twice a month by heading over to ko-fi.com slash makeshift stories and making a one-time donation or becoming an ongoing supporter at patreon.com slash makeshift stories. And if you can, please leave us a review or rating wherever you're listening to the podcast. It helps new listeners discover us. If you'd like to connect with us, please send an email to makeshiftstories at gmail.com or visit our website at makeshiftstories.com. Makeshift Stories is released around the beginning and middle of the month. This month's story was written and read by Alan V. Hare. Opening and closing themes were composed and recorded by Matthew Erdman. Makeshift Stories is produced by Vicada Studios, 
and is released under a Creative Commons non-commercial attribution, no derivative license.